We're in Matthew chapter 9, and starting in verse 35, and we'll go on into uh, to chapter 10, a uh, message entitled, Jesus uh, Multiplies uh, the Ministry. And there's some uh, very important uh, principles here and, uh, and things that I think if we will allow them to capture our hearts could really, could really change uh, our lives and, and change the world around us. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we uh, come to you now as we begin the study of, uh, of your word once, uh, once again that we never do, do lightly, Lord. We, uh, we believe that it's, uh, that it's uh, the Holy Bible inspired by, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, uh, your children, again, uh, bearing the Holy Spirit in us, Lord, you have a way uh, to speak from your word directly to our, our hearts in that way, and we ask you to do that now. And Lord, whatever is going on in, in our lives, in the world, and some of the other things that may be distracting, we pray that you might uh, help us settle our hearts and minds in, uh, in this place, which, uh, Lord, we call a sanctuary, which means it's set apart, and it's set apart for uh, our worship of you and, and what we're about to do right now. So I pray that uh, we could really uh, hear from you this morning through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So when we left our study, we did the Mother's Day message, but when we left our study two weeks ago, just to, um, again, realize that uh, there's, there's a drama unfolding, and, and I, I hope that in a sense, that in our study of Matthew, that we realize, or you get a sense that we're kind of long for the journey. I mean, we're going along, and we're, they're being discipled by Jesus, and we are too, as we go through the Word. And we're seeing this drama unfold of the disciples being taught and they're going to get some very important principles and be, be ready to be sent out to be doing some ministry for the very first time. Uh, and so that's going to be a, of critical importance. At the same time, last time in our study, earlier in chapter 9, we had kind of a, a culmination of, of the Pharisees, an official delegation of Pharisees from Jerusalem being sent up as they should have been to investigate the messianic claims of Jesus of Nazareth. He has is, he is taken the titles and the claims of the Messiah. He is doing not just a few miracles. He's doing thousands of miracles. Uh, and, and certainly everybody uh, pretty much in Israel is probably hearing uh, about Jesus of Nazareth who's claiming and to be the Messiah and exhibiting the credentials of the Messiah. And that kind of came to a head in chapter 9. And then we're going to see a repeat of that scene uh, here in a couple of chapters of uh, the Pharisees witnessing Jesus cast a demon out of somebody that was mute. And again, remember the uh, rabbinical uh, teaching and tradition, uh, the way they did exorcism was to engage the demon verbally, find out its name, cast it out. So if that person is unable to speak, it can't be done. The only person that can cast that demon out is the Messiah. And Jesus does it. So then the Pharisees say, well, you did that by the power of the devil. They don't deny the miracle. They don't deny that he did it. They just, it's either get on their knees and, and bow or, 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 or explain it some other way. That same type of thing is going to officially happen in a short time after this by an official delegation of not just the Pharisees, and that will be the rejection of Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel. And, and there'll be a, 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 a definite departure in the ministry and the teaching and everything that happens in the life of Jesus after that. But this is kind of a precursor. Now again, Matthew takes his material and it's not arranged chronologically in sequence. It's topically. That event happened, so now Matthew brings the information to us of Jesus now kind of in a sense bearing down a little bit on his guys and saying, now, now that you're following me, <clears throat> realize a few things. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to send you out. Here's some principles you're going to have to follow, but you won't even get that far if you don't get a vision for what this is all about. And uh, I think the same is true for uh, us as well. Uh, this is a great passage about uh, missions and, and evangelism in, in, in general. I went on um, the Center for World Missions uh, just to see the latest statistics of, in terms of those that are, have not been reached with the gospel, never heard the gospel at all. Currently, it's about 28% of the population of, of the world. 
you think, well, we're, we're doing pretty good. Well, 28% is 1,871,208,000. That's of, uh, very current of over the last couple of months of the people that keep those kind of statistics. So uh, we've got a long ways to go in terms of evangelism in the world, and it'll never get done if we don't understand this passage. So let's, let's jump in. Verse 35 to 38, Jesus cast a vision for a ministry. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So uh, the first thing we notice about this idea of vision is that Jesus continued to give the disciples vision for ministry by his example. Interesting that uh, I was just hearing uh, one of my favorite radio teachers this week, not me, but uh, Stonebreaker, and he was, uh, he was talking about the illustration of the idea of uh, eagles and how, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, mother and father eagles teaching the eaglets to fly. And one of the first things that they do, you've probably heard the story about how they kick them out of the nest and let them, you know, <laughs> kind of fall and fall and then grab them at the last minute. But before that, they hover and they fly over the nest. Uh, and they do this repeatedly because uh, if the eaglet can't see it, parents fly, can't see it extend its wings and fly, it will never learn to fly itself. It's got to first be able to see it by example if it will ever do it. And, uh, and that's what we see here. Jesus has got these guys, and, and again, we'll, we'll make a distinction in a moment, but uh, when it says disciples, it's many disciples. Out of those many disciples, he's going to choose 12 that will come with him personally, and he's going to call them apostles. But many disciples at this point, and he continues to, uh, to actually set the example for them. Now, when it says in all the towns and villages uh, of that area, we know that during the time of Jesus, that's about 214 towns and villages in, in northern Israel. Uh, so this is no, no small doings. Uh, and I keep trying to repeat the idea of when Jesus healed every sickness, every disease, that we're in the thousands. This, this is a very huge thing that's, uh, that's going on. Sometimes we have these visions from Hollywood or, or, or something of Jesus kind of going down the dusty road and there's like 40 people listening to him or something. This is, a, is much more grander in terms of uh, uh, just the sheer numbers than, uh, than we might uh, have suspected. And he, uh, he's teaching and casting this vision by example. Secondly, Jesus gave the disciples vision for ministry by his compassion. And this is very important, and we're going to spend a bit of time on it. And I'm going to go through several passages to help us kind of grasp it. Uh, the word compassion means something that you feel internally as opposed to understand intellectually. And um, uh, again, the ancients, when they, they use phrases like... Um, you know, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Sometimes we think of heart as our emotions. They did not. Anytime they make a reference to your heart, it's always the intellect, the mind, your understanding. Guard your intellect and your thinking. It's the wellspring of life. See, that's very different than we might uh, suspect. When they made reference to the uh, passion or compassion or emotion, it was always the, the bowels. We might say it's gut-wrenching. That would be our vernacular and much more closer to this idea uh, of compassion. If, um, if I were to show you uh, a slide or a picture, for example, of maybe a, a little boy, a little girl, three or four years old, from a, a third world country that has a, a deformed face and needs uh, surgery very, very badly, uh, what would your reaction, and you see them on commercials and ads and so forth, and, uh, and the concern to get them the medical attention that they need. Uh, when you see that, I don't think that you intellectually go, oh, that's very interesting. I, I note that uh, her lip is uh, approximately six centimeters higher than it actually, no, you, you don't do that. You're just, you're just, it kind of, hopefully you feel something. I don't, I don't know if, you, if you've seen someone that's a burn victim and you, you feel something. I mean, you're, you're physically moved uh, inside. That is the word compassion that Jesus uses here. 
When Jesus says he looks on the multitudes with compassion, it means he hurts in his guts because of what he sees. Uh, and again, the illustrations he gives us will help us understand why. But, uh, but just a couple of other verses and certainly a worthy study just to go look at all the times that compassion is associated with Jesus. But uh, Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. He saw them and what he saw affected him emotionally and actually physically to the point that he, he had to do something. Uh, Matthew 15, 32, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Matthew 20, 34, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight uh, and followed him. And we could go uh, on and on. Uh, the reason that you and I are alive today is because of the compassion of God. Laminations 3.22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jesus looked out and he had compassion. He set an example for ministry, but uh, uh, he had certainly great compassion as well. I want to look at another uh, passage uh, looking at the life of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.19. Uh, I have this verse for you, and it's probably a familiar one. But again, as we read it, keep in mind that the reason Paul is saying this, the reason Paul did what he did as a missionary, the reason he was uh, able to be beaten and brutalized himself and left for dead and then get up and go right back into the same city is because he had compassion. Uh, it says there, though I am, Paul speaking, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone. To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win the Jews, to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Paul was already a Jew. What is he talking about? He says, I became like a, a, a person under the law. He's, he's Jewish, no, under the, no longer under the law, but he was willing to live under the law, keep the sacrifices, do what he ever had to do in order, you know, keep certain days, keep a certain diet if he was going to be able to communicate the gospel more, more fully, win somebody in that cultural uh, setting uh, to, to faith in Christ. Uh, verse 21, he goes on, to those not having the law, Gentiles, I became like one not having the law. Although I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, the law of love. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessing. Paul was able to do what he did. Whatever it took, in a sense, without compromising, uh, you know, again, uh, the word of God, without compromising his personal integrity and so forth, he was willing to do whatever it took to get the gospel to somebody because he had compassion uh, for them. Uh, again, Jesus is willing to go to the Samaritan woman, somebody nobody else would have any dealings with. He goes to a Roman centurion and, and so many others, even to lepers, because he has compassion. Because when Jesus sees them, he is physically and emotionally moved internally. Now, why does he do that? And that's, we can help understand that if we see that this next section. Jesus gave the disciples a vision, and hopefully us as well, for ministry by giving them an urgent call, and he gives two illustrations. The first illustration, he told them that the harvest was plentiful, and he refers to God as the Lord of the harvest. I've heard this explained in the past in a couple of different ways. One is the idea that, that the idea is you look out into the, the crowds of people, the multitudes, and you see them like a harvest field. Uh, therefore, that harvest is only there so long. As the farmer looks at the harvest, he knows he's got to get out there and get it in quick because it's only going to be good for so long. And so there's a sense of urgency. And there, there is a sense of urgency uh, here. 
Uh, the other way I've heard it explained is that plus the idea that uh, be, there are those ready to be harvested. If we're out there sharing the gospel enough uh, with everybody and spreading, see, uh, sowing those seeds of the gospel, that we're going to see those people that are ready to be harvested, ready to receive Christ, and take our sickle out and, and harvest them and, and lead them to faith in Christ. And I think that's a, a wonderful application uh, but I don't think uh, that's what this text is saying uh, at all. Uh, what does the Bible mean? What does Jesus mean when he makes reference to something being a harvest? Well, let me, uh, let me read you a couple of verses and the conclusion will be fairly obvious. If you want to go over a couple of chapters to chapter 13 of Matthew, beginning of verse 37, Jesus is explaining uh, in a parable there about the, the uh, sowing good seed, and then the devil comes and sows bad seed, grows up as, uh, uh, again, as the idea of, of thistles or, and so forth, so you can't tell one from another. But uh, he explains the idea of harvest there. I have this verse for you as well. The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, uh, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. It will be, they will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears, let him hear. So when is the harvest? The harvest is at the end of the age when the judgment of God comes. So when Jesus says, he looks over the multitudes and he's moved internally. He hurts inside because of what he sees is multitudes of people that are on their way to hell and that are going to perish. Therefore, pray for more workers to go into the harvest field. Now, there's certainly there's still a sense of urgency, but that's a little different, uh, isn't it? And, uh, and if anything else, I mean, the thing to, uh, that we'd ask ourselves, the thing that Jesus is trying to get into the heart of these guys before he sends them out is, what is it that you see when you see other people? Uh, when you're down at Kailua Beach and the windsurfers are going and things are happening and people are laughing and having a good time. When you drive by... Kailua Intermediate and all the soccer teams that are out there playing. You know, when you go to different areas, what do you think about, what do you see when you see those people? What Jesus sees is he hurts internally as, the, as an incarnate man. He hurts internally because he sees people, the multitudes on their way to hell. Because he's already said, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate or the way that leads to eternal life. And many are going on that broad road. So now before he sends these guys out, he's trying to give them a, a vision for, for ministry. And the vision for ministry is not something in a sense that so you can feel better about yourself or you've done something good for God or you meet wonderful people or so forth. And that all, that all those things may be true in, in serving the Lord, uh, but it has nothing to do, it, do with it. I, is, uh, I was reminded of a, of a story of a, of a guy that had spent about 20 years on the mission field and was home on furlough and was asked to uh, speak at a, at a youth group, and, uh, and which he did. He was happy to do it. And he wasn't the most dynamic speaker, and the kids were a little bit restless. And, uh, and basically, he just said, it's very hard. It's very difficult. People are not very responsive to the gospel. Life, life is hard where we're at. Uh, I don't know that you'd really care for it. There's not much in the way of creature comforts and things like it was kind of a little, a little discouraging. A little, and one of the kids finally, finally said, well, why are you doing it then? And he's, because he was about ready to go back. Uh, he says, well, um, uh, it's, I'm just trying to be faithful. That's all. I'm just trying to be faithful. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll ever lead anybody to the Lord, but we haven't. It's been 20 years. It's not, he's, do you guys ever do something, even when it's not easy, you just do it because it's the right thing to do? <laughs> he finally said to him. That's kind of what it's like serving the Lord. It wasn't a real inspiration. Uh, he was just telling them like it is. Uh, but you only do that kind of stuff 
uh, if you understand what Jesus was talking about uh, in this passage. I want to give you a couple of more verses to substantiate what I'm saying. Revelation 14, 14. Again, this is, uh, you're going to see similar language. Again, Revelation at this point, very, very metaphorical kinds of language trying to describe judgment at the end time. I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap. Because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came out from the altar and called in a loud voice to who, him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stradia. That's at the end of time when there's a great harvest. The great harvest is the judgment of God. Certainly there's a certain uh, sense of uh, urgency, but it's not simply, hey, there's some crops out there and we need to get them in real quick. Uh, it, it, there's a little more to it than that. So maybe now you can understand why when Jesus looked and moved with compassion, you understand what he's talking about. Jude 21, 23 says, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Again, it's they're on their way. It's like they're in the fire and we're out there snatching them out of the fire, even as the Lord did for us uh, at one point in time uh, as well. Now, the second illustration goes along with that. The second illustration Jesus used was the idea of sheep that were without a shepherd. He says they were harassed. And they were helpless. Uh, the word, uh, and I looked in many translations, but this word harassed in the NIV is not bad, but still it doesn't quite get it. Uh, the word in the Greek is skulo. It means to skin, to fillet, to rend, to mangle. That's a little more than harassed. When Jesus looks with compassion, he sees them like the harvest at the end and people are being judged and going to hell. That's what he sees. He sees them also like a shepherd looking out to the sheep, but the sheep are being ripped apart. They're being ripped open. They're being torn apart. They're being mangled. That's what Jesus sees. Because that's what sin does. That's what the sin in this world does. That's what the devil does to people's lives. And, and certainly we can see that. I mean, we may have experienced it. We still experience it at times in our lives, but certainly we see it just we could talk about uh, ice and drugs, all kinds of different things. It just ravages people's lives. Uh, and Jesus saw their lives and he, saw, he understood what was going on in the dynamics of what would happen in the future as a result. Uh, the word helpless means to be thrown down or to cast down. So that's the, the second illustration to help us understand his heart for ministry. Therefore, in verse 38... He says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. So, uh, th the application is we're supposed to pray for more missionaries and evangelists, basically. We're supposed to be doing that. Certainly, we need to be praying for the ones that are already sent, but we're supposed to be praying for others to be sent. Uh, and I think if we can kind of grasp this idea of Jesus casting a vision for ministry, and we understand what, what the vision is. The vision is not to have the biggest church in America, as, uh, as one uh, popular speaker said today, or some of these other strange ideas that people throw out there in terms of what your vision for ministry is supposed to be. This is the vision of ministry from, from Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's very different than what's being popularized in our own culture today. Uh, they're headed for judgment. 
we need to pray for more workers. And, uh, and of course, if you start praying for more workers, what's coming up next? He might ask you to go. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's look what happens next. Jesus confers authority for ministry, and that is in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 10. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the name of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed them. A couple things we know. And the first just, again, he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, heal every sickness. How many sicknesses? Every sickness and disease. There's disciples that, that, are, that are maybe, maybe uh, ranging in the hundreds uh, at this point. Uh, and then he chooses out of those disciples, 12 uh, that he calls apostles. Apostle is just a term that means one sent, but in that context, it was one sent on behalf of a governing authority. Uh, they are given authority, like we might say an, an ambassador that is sent from one country to another. He's there to speak on behalf and represent that country. They're being sent in terms of the authority and being representatives of the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ. Uh, and therefore, he gives to them the same kind of authority over sickness, disease, and evil spirits that he has uh, himself. Uh, again, does God still do these same things and heal today? Yes, but not in the degree that he did with these 12 guys. The New Testament has not been written. This is the new message, the good news uh, that's going out proclaiming Jesus is the Messiah, a Messiah who's going to die for their sins and they can have eternal life. And we preach it because he has died for us. Uh, but he sends them out and he then gives them power and authority so that they can offer up credentials to say, I am a true representative of Jesus Christ. Are there any present day apostles? No, <laughs> there's, there's, there might be B apostles, but there's no A apostles. Uh, there's th these 12 guys have come and gone and passed off the scene. There's nobody out there healing every disease and every sickness and, uh, and, and so forth. But it was important that they had this ability to be able to prove who they were. Jesus gave them uh, this power. Uh, and then, again, we'll, we'll note uh, later a distinction. It's not to say that Jesus doesn't still heal, cast out demons, raise the dead, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and most of it, a lot of us in this room have, have uh, seen, uh, experienced firsthand at least some uh, sense of the miraculous power of Jesus Christ in this area. The greatest miracle is certainly being born again of God's spirit. Uh, but we certainly, we, if you're around long enough and keep praying for people long enough and pray with others that pray for people or get on the prayer chain, you'll see God do some miraculous things uh, uh, sooner or later uh, firsthand. The second thing uh, about this is we're given the names of the 12 to whom he gave this authority. And, and uh, I, I hope that as you read through this, uh, you, get, you, you almost chuckle to yourself as opposed to getting a stained glass image. I hope that you read through this list and go, Peter, <laughs> that cracks me up. I mean, I, I hope you know these guys enough by now from the Gospels that you get kind of a kick out of the people that Jesus chose. And this is after he prayed all night. You know, I, I, this list, is, I think, is meant to be just a tremendous encouragement to us. If God can use these guys, he can use anybody. Uh, can you imagine Matthew, the tax collector, one of the most hated men in Israel, and then you, you get Simon the Zealot. Uh, he was the militant, uh, you know, sect of Judaism. You know, carried his dagger on him. Kill a Roman anytime he had half a chance. This guy had sold out to the Romans. Okay, we'll just put you guys together. You know, I mean, uh, this, you know, every time they sat down to a meal, remember, they sat at a table, at least in a formal setting, uh, called a Roman triclinium, which meant there was a, a table, not, not like Leonardo da Vinci painted it, but a table that went, went this way, this way, and this way. And, and uh, you sat according to uh, the host, uh, the person that was the uh, guest of honor, Jesus. And then from here going this way, it was a pecking order. The most important this way. That's where they were fighting every time they sat down to eat. And always arguing over who's greatest in the kingdom. 
And even James and John sending their mother to talk to Jesus saying, hey, when you come into your kingdom, do you think my sons can sit at your right hand or your left hand? You know, uh, all this stuff is going on that we know about. Uh, I think this list is, again, three sets of uh, uh, brothers and, and just a, a gamut, the fishermen and, and uh, these guys uh, with, quote, no formal education and, and so forth that uh, God used uh, tremendously. Uh, in a parallel account in Mark 3.13, it says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called those he wanted. Uh, I like that. <laughs> he, he, he actually wanted these guys. It wasn't like, well, I'm going to send 12 guys out and you're the only guys that showed up this morning. Okay, you know. Uh, no, he actually wanted these guys uh, and how radically their lives were, uh, were changed. Uh, not only calls us as well, not only qualifies us by the gift of the Holy Spirit, but he actually wants us. Uh, he wants to use us more than we want to be used. He wants to bless us more than we want to be blessed. Uh, if we'll just come and, in a sense, get a vision for ministry that he's casting here, realize he does confer authority to us, uh, certainly uh, over the de uh, the demons uh, of this world, the, the power of Jesus uh, on our lips and uh, and on our knees in, in prayer, and, uh, and God do, does continue to heal. Uh, but again, not every time, all the time, we have no credentials to lay out. We come as his servants. Uh, the third thing here is uh, Jesus gave specific commands for ministry, and there's five of them uh, in verses 5 to 15. The 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Uh, do not go among the Gentiles or in any, any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff, for the wor worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So the uh, first command is he gave a specific command limiting uh, who they would minister to and with. Uh, and again, this, this command is, uh, uh, is really not for us anymore. This is for a very specific uh, uh, point in time for these guys. Uh, you can read some uh, commentaries and, and say that uh, because Jesus was sending these guys out for the very first time, he certainly was not going to send them cross-cultural right off the bat. Uh, another people group, another language, so on and so forth, uh, would have been far too difficult. That is not what this is all about at all. Uh, the, the gospel according to Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul, had to go to the Jews uh, first. That's what Paul says in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then, then for the Gentile. I remember reading a story about Hudson Taylor one time, and every January 1st, he'd write out a little check and a little letter, send it off to a, a friend of his who had a ministry specifically to the Jews, and in the note, it would say, first to the Jews, Hudson Taylor. He would send him an offering from China. And then that missionary would always get it, and then write a note back that said, and to the Gentiles, and he'd send him the same amount right back to, <laughs> to Hudson Taylor. But that's what's going on here. But of course, at the Great Commission, then Jesus says to go into all the world. In Acts 1.8, he says, But the power shall, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you with power, and you shall be my witnesses both here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and Hawaii, the uttermost parts of the world. That's we're about as uttermost as you can get from, uh, from Jerusalem. If you took a globe and put a pin all the way through it from Jerusalem, you came out the other side, I think you would uh, uh, hit the Hawaiian Islands. So, uh, again, in principle, they're to go. They're, uh, uh, at this point in time, are limited, uh, and that would change after the death and resurrection of, of Jesus, but first to the Jew. Secondly, he gave a specific command on the message they would preach. They were to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand or near. 
Luke's gospel tells us that they, when they went out preaching the gospel, uh, and uh, Mark's gospel says they went out and they preached that people should repent. So again, the, uh, the ministry in terms of the message uh, is the same. Jesus is the Messiah. He's going to die for their sins. He did die for our sins, past tense. Uh, we place our faith in him, and by God's grace, uh, we are saved and receive eternal life. Uh, we need to receive the gospel and repent from our sins. Uh, the gospel is still a, a very simple me message to deliver. Uh, thirdly, a specific command on, the, on mercy uh, that they should show. Uh, again, here it is. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and drive out, out demons. I wanted to read one reference to you, just this idea uh, that they needed to prove their credentials. The writer of Hebrews mentions this specifically. Therefore, uh, he says in Hebrews 2, 1, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation of disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, the Lord Jesus, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. The apostles heard it and it was confirmed again uh, by their miracle working ability. Verse 4, God also testified to it by signs, wonders, various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to uh, his will. Uh, these guys were very dynamic in what they were doing. And uh, if you go on, we go on and read, when they come back, they were just a little excited. <laughs> Do you remember that part? They were pretty excited because the demons fled and the sick were, you know, were healed. And remember what Jesus says to them? He says, don't get excited about that stuff. Just be glad you have a relationship with me. You just needed to kind of be able to prove that you are my apostles and my ambassadors and my representatives right now because of the message that's going out. But be excited about their relationship with me and, and not this other stuff. Although it was necessary and it was important. And we still certainly should continue to pray for the sick uh, and that they would be healed. And, and uh, we pray for God's mercy. And, and uh, it's a wonderful thing when he, when he moves and he does move in the miraculous. Uh, the third thing is that he gave a specific command for the money needed on their journey. Don't take any. <laughs> But take big offerings. No, that's not what, it's, what it says. Uh, you freely receive, uh, freely give. Don't take any extra money, any extra supplies. The worker is worthy uh, of his hire. Uh, Jesus wants them to go out and really uh, practice their, their faith and just uh, uh, trust him. Do people still do this? People still do this. Uh, a number of years ago when we were on a trip, and, uh, and we were in Kunming, but it was uh, the previous... Uh, trip uh, a number of years ago, and we met a, a, a couple from, uh, they were from Holland, so they were good friends of our uh, missionary uh, down there, and uh, we went to see them, uh, and they had been there for a, a number of years, and uh, it was very interesting to hear him share his uh, testimony, especially it's a little more effective when you're, you're sitting there, you know, in their apartment in Kunming, you know, at the, at the time, adds a little to the flavor having left the, uh, the restaurant uh, while you were eating and had the jars of snakes lined up behind your head there in case you wanted one of those. Yeah, you, know, you know the whole, the, the, Chinese, the Chinese say that Adam and Eve, you know, were not Chinese. Uh, do you know why? They would have eaten the snake. <laughs> so they know that Adam and Eve originally were not Chinese. <laughs> Chinese like to tell, tell that story. But um, uh, nonetheless, uh, we're there in the guy's apartment. It was just, uh, he was uh, discipling uh, some young Chinese guys that were part of the house church, and the uh, Lord was blessing their ministry, but he would get on, he was pretty fr proficient with his language, and he would get on a bus and, and ride up into the, uh, into the mountains, into where the minority tribes live, uh, and just like this, he would just go into a village where maybe they've never heard the gospel, and he would talk and try to meet, and if there was somebody friendly there and open a little bit, he'd share with them, and, and typically uh, they would invite him for a meal and uh, share a little bit more, and a lot of times they'd, why don't you stay the night, and so he would. And uh, if he found somebody worthy to show gracious hospitality, just like this, then he would stay. And, and really, that's how the ministry would begin. And then keep going back, keep going back until he would lead somebody to the Lord. And then maybe his friend, his neighbor, until he could get a little Bible study going in, in that village. He went into a village and nobody was open. Everybody rejected. 
shake the dust off your feet, just go to the next one. And that's what he had been doing for a, a couple of years and had led uh, uh, several to the Lord, had several Bible studies going, but people still do this uh, exactly, uh, exactly this way. I uh, no, I've told this before, but a, a number of years ago, 12, 14 years ago, the first time I went to uh, India, I preached at a, uh, a missions conference up in uh, Bihar, which is way in the north. From where we, we were, you could see the, the foothills of... Um, uh, the Himalayas, and you could see Nepal, basically. They uh, told us there was nothing to worry about, even though they had guards <laughs> around the building we were in it, uh, uh, at, at night. And uh, we, were, uh, we were there, and I met a, a guy named George. And, of course, he's probably given that name uh, when he was baptized. A lot of the Indian guys, their name identifies their caste system. And so a lot of times, if they're from a lower caste, they'll give them a new Christian name because it frees them you know, from that caste system and the discrimination, the de derogatory remarks and everything that goes along with it. And so George was an uh, Indian guy and he had, uh, ministry was up in the foothills of the Himalayas there, uh, up in Nepal. And uh, his effective ministry was uh, two little blocks of wood. And uh, uh, he took them out, his little backpack and showed them to me, very well worn. And I said, well, how do you use your blocks of wood to share the gospel? Oh, it's very simple, brother. And then he says, you know, every time he crosses a hill, he hits another dialect. He spoke about six languages and about 12 dialects. And he says he would go into an area and there's always uh, kind of the center of the village, typically where the water supply was. And he would just stand there and sing Hindi or some language he thinks maybe somebody would know in that village. Hit his little blocks of wood, sing his gospel songs. All day, all day, all day, all the next 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 day, all the, until somebody came by that understood what he was saying and what he was singing. And then he could engage in conversation with them. And if they were open, try to share the gospel with them. Even if they weren't, he would ask them to teach him the language of that particular village, which he would then learn the language. Uh, and then he would compose a new gospel song for those people in that language, go back to the water well the next day, play his little block, sing his gospel songs day after day after day till someone said, what is it that you're singing about? What is that good news? How is it that we can know God? You're saying we can know God. We have many gods here. And he would begin to engage until he led someone to the Lord and someone else and someone else and someone else until he had a group in a Bible study, then appointed an elder walked across the next mountain range, new language, new dialect, started it all over again. He'd planted about 35 churches. He's a pretty young guy too. You don't do that unless you have compassion for the lost. Do you see what Jesus, if he doesn't do that, they're going to hell is what he believes. So that's why, why he, he goes. But again, they go, these guys go without really knowing where, where the supply is going to come from. Uh, but they're out practicing their faith. Uh, and again, that goes along with the, the, the last principle here. He gave a specific command for those that they would personally meet. If somebody shows them gracious hospitality, then hey, their, their, their blessings would remain on that place. Uh, and if not, they would, they would move on. You can understand the dynamics of this a little bit. If Peter, James, or John walk into a village and then somebody uh, maybe it's the poorest guy in the village and he opens their home and they have a very meager meal with him that night. Then they get up the next day and they go to the town square and they begin to preach the gospel and they heal every person that's sick, every person that has a disease, cast every demon out. Do you think they'd be a little popular at that point? Do you think maybe there'd be a few other people saying, hey, I didn't know you can come stay at my house. But Jesus says, don't do that. I don't care if it's the richest guy that says it to you. Whoever opens their home, you stay with them and you be a blessing to them. Don't let the power I'm giving you somehow be used by you for your own self edification and elevation that you would somehow have some kind of financial gain out of this. Jesus says, don't let that happen. Aren't you glad everybody's really stuck to that one? <clears throat> Trust the Lord and, and, and kind of... Uh, Again, minister where, where people first receive you and minister. And when you go, blessings upon them. As you go to another place, if they reject you, do people reject you sometimes sharing the gospel? Yes, they do. Did Jesus say that they would? Yes, he did. What are you supposed to do? 
I just get upset. I ain't doing that again. That's not what he said. He said, shake it off. <laughs> Your dad ever tell you that when you fell on the ground? Shake it off. You're okay. <laughs> so my dad used to tell me. Uh, that's what Jesus is saying. Don't let it bother you. It's going to happen. You're out sharing the gospel. You're going to face reject. It's okay. Just shake the dust off your feet. That's what Paul and Barnabas do in Acts 13. Uh, they're there and they're having some uh, impact with the gospel in Poseidon and Antioch and they're sharing in the synagogues and of course they get to resistance and they're trying to drive them out of the village. They go out to the edge of the village and read it, Acts 13. They shake the dust off their feet and they go on to Iconium. Well, we did what we could. We'll move along. God bless them. But notice what Jesus says also is that to those that do reject them, that do reject in terms of a city, a place, it will be more bearable, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, than for that town or that village uh, at the day of judgment. To whom much is given, much is required. And it really should um, make us shake in our boots a little bit in terms of the United States of America. We've been entrusted with a lot in terms of the Bible, the gospel, uh, evangelism, the freedom to share the, the, the gospel, Christian radio, Christian television, and uh, yet at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it, it doesn't seem to always take hold like it should. I read one statistic the other day uh, off a of Focus on the Family site, and I can't recall the, the survey they were quoting who did it, but uh, they were listing uh, Protestants in general only about 41% in this country even believe in a literal hell. This message will do them no good. They'll never understand the compassion that Jesus had for the lost, why anyone should ever go. Uh, and yet, uh, everybody's got the, the same truth uh, of the word of God. Again, so for us, we need to be praying for more workers. And um, I uh, hate to... Did you ever used to watch Magnum P.I.? Uh, and you remember Higgins, and Higgins always had a story. Oh, back in 42, I think it was the Boer War, actually. I'm afraid I'm becoming Higgins. But, uh, of course, if you didn't see the show, it makes no sense to you. But uh, anybody under, under 25 was going, what was that? <laughs> but when I was in Pakistan, uh, I was only there once with our missionaries who uh, have the, uh, are basically... Uh, operating in another Muslim country now. But they, they were in Pakistan and Lahore at the time, and I went and I spent a week teaching in their uh, discipleship training school there. And some of the brothers there, uh, the Pakistani guys, said to me, in, in America, in the United States, in your church, uh, do, you, do you pray for the church in Iran? Because they're right across the border. And I had to tell you the truth. I didn't even, at the time, I didn't even know there were Christians in Iran. <laughs> And I, have to, I had to admit to him, I'd never prayed for the, for the Christians or the workers or the missionaries in Iran. And it kind of, I felt bad. I mean, because these are the guys that are, and those guys did, because they were Pakistani and stuff, they could cross the border and go in and minister to the church uh, there, there in, in Iran. I felt like it was such a a privilege to be uh, teaching these guys and uh, ministering to them uh, for, for a week. But they, they had the ability to get in and, and do that. Uh, there's more Christians in Iran than there is in Japan, by the way, percentage-wise. There's three or four percent. There's only less than a half percent in Japan. If that puts that in context, why we're trying to reach people in Japan with the gospel. But uh, again, we're supposed to be praying as believers, according to Jesus, if we have compassion for the lost for more workers, for more people to be sent. Uh, certainly then, we need to be praying for the ones that have already been sent. So if you haven't already, it's a whole host of little, little picture cards you can stick on your refrigerator of, of the ones that we've already sent. That's not exactly all the missionaries in the world. That's just the ones from, from our, uh, our own fellowship. But at the same time, I think the ultimate prayer has got to be, Lord, give me compassion like you had compassion for the lost. Because if, if we don't, I don't think we will pray. I don't think we'll move any, I don't think we'll ever get off the dime in terms of sharing the gospel. We might because we just get confronted with somebody that's just dying to be saved and they know we're a Christian and they ask us. You know, uh, uh, you know there could be you know, that rare opportunity, that once in a lifetime or twice in a lifetime where maybe you lead somebody to, the, to Christ. Uh, but if we, if we understand the vision that Jesus is casting, 
to the disciples before he deals with the apostles and the instructions there. If we can kind of get the vision, I think God will, God will move because we will. We'll begin to pray. We'll begin to move. We'll begin to share. We'll begin, again, the question to ask yourself is that when you drive down the Pauly Highway and you see all those lights at night, do you see homes where, where thousands of people are on their way to hell? Is that the vision that comes to mind? Maybe not. So, but it should be. When you see that, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more workers into the harvest field of those soccer moms on Kainalu Drive and, and the kids over here at Kailua Beach and all the ones down there riding their boogie boards uh, to, today. Uh, we need to pray that God would send workers into the harvest field. And of course, it wouldn't hurt if we were willing to go our, ourselves. And that's something to pray about as well. Matthew 28, 19, just to close with this, kind of the classic passage uh, for, for sending and going. Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And just a couple things about this verse, the therefore go is, is the way it's structured is the assumption are you're going. Therefore go since you're going. Uh, that is not even the emphasis. The emphasis in the verse is on make disciples because it's an assumption that you'll go. The emphasis in the Greek is on, is on make disciples. But it's assumed that you would go <laughs> to, uh, to the lost. Uh, and again, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. i
Yeah. 